right, the me this meeting is being called to order. Councilman Reno, would you please start us with the invocation? Let us bow our heads. I'm sorry. I have a problem with this. Let us bow our heads and remember that we are in the presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for all the blessings you have bestowed on us. We ask, Lord, that you comfort and heal all those in our community who are ill and convalescing. Lord of mercy, we pray for the souls of all of our departed brothers and sisters. May they rejoice in your kingdom where all our tears are wiped away. God of peace, we pray for those who have served our nation and have laid down their lives to protect and defend our freedom. We pray for those who have fought, whose spirits and bodies are scarred by war, whose nights are haunted by memories too painful for the light of day. We pray for those who serve us now, especially those in harm's way. Shield them from danger and bring them home. Turn the hearts and minds of our leaders and our enemies to the work of justice and a harvest of peace. May the peace you left us, the peace you gave us, the peace that sustains and the peace that saves us. As is written in Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In the peace of Christ we pray, amen. Councilman Segor, would you please announce the young man who will be leading us in the pledge, please, and introduce him. Yes. Uh, as some of you may not know, I'm a uh, scout leader with Troop 223 here at the Kenner Lions Club next door, and I have one of the uh, young men from my troop here tonight. I'd like to call him forward, let him introduce himself, tell us what he's here for, and then he can lead us in the pledge. Hi. My name is Reagan Wallace, and I'm with Troop 223, and I'm here working on a requirement for my citizenship in the community merit badge. Good. Please lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chairman, you have a quorum. In accordance with Council Resolution Number B-14550, please be advised that all cellular telephones, pagers, beepers, and other devices of this nature must be deactivated or silenced throughout the council meeting. The consent agenda, item one, approval of minutes of the regular council meeting of October 16, 2014. Item two, approval of alcoholic beverage permit applications. We have none. Item three, approval of bingo and public gathering applications. Item three A, application number 1852-14. American Legion, Kenner Post 377 to hold a public gathering on November 14, 2014 from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. for the purpose of a flag disposal ceremony at 3740 Florida Avenue, Kenner, Louisiana. Item 3B is application number 1853-14, American Legion, Kenner Post 377 to hold a public gathering on November 15, 2014 from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. for the purpose of a kids fair at Veterans Park, Kenner, Louisiana. Item four, correspondence reports from the mayor, CAO, and or department heads. Item four A, at the request of the administration, an introduction of the Tulane University School of Architecture, Tulane Region, Regional Urban Design Center, True DC, regarding a, a consulting agreement entered into between the city of Kenner and True DC for the establishment of design guidelines and other matters for the Rivertown Historic District. Would the gentleman representing the Tulane Regional Urban Design Center please step to the mic and introduce himself, please? All right, uh, Madam President, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to introduce uh, to the council 
uh, two gentlemen who are going to be working very closely with our department over the next seven weeks. That's Mr. Grover Mouton and Mr. Nick Jenish. They're, uh, they're with Tulane University's Regional Urban Design Center. Uh, we reached out to them several months ago for their assistance to help us provide and develop design guidelines for the Rivertown Historic District. Uh, for those of you who may not be uh, totally familiar with the history of Rivertown, Rivertown was developed as a local historic district back in 1983. Uh, the purpose of that was to help uh, maintain and preserve the uh, colonial and the Victorian architectural characteristics of many of the historic buildings down there. However, when they did that, uh, there were no guidelines that were actually adopted to assist us in preserving those characteristics. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we reached out to Tulane. And um, again, at this time, I'd like to invite them to introduce themselves, explain a little bit about the work that they'll be doing for us and uh, the services that are provided by the center. First, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Aber, and my apologies to you. I'm so glad you did do the introduction give, and gave us that information. I think it will put in perspective uh, that which they're going to be speaking to us before the council and the audience. Thank you. If you would please introduce yourself, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Grover Mouton. I'm the director of the Regional Urban Design Center at Tulane School of Architecture. And <clears throat> my assistant is Nick Jenish here. And Nick, you want to give me a little update on what we're doing? Sure. Uh, Grover can tell you a little bit about his experience um, with design guidelines in other, in other parts of the state and the region. Um, but I'm Nick Jenish. I'm the uh, project director at the Regional Urban Design Center. We do a lot of uh, outreach design work throughout the region. We work with a lot of cities and mayors um, in design matters, everything from wayfinding packages to um, park designs and other, and other things like that. Uh, we're housed in the School of Architecture uh, at Tulane University's Uptown Campus. And um, we're looking, uh, we're working closely with the planning department and, um, and the city to understand what our guidelines can can help the existing historic district commission um, in order to preserve the characteristics that, that Jay mentioned. And so, the district at the district commission, as it's set up, already has legal teeth and has the ability to guide some of those uh, design decisions. Uh, but we're just trying to give that commission, and we've met with them as well, and we'll continue to do so. Um, further guidelines and checklists and, and other things that they're able to use in terms of color palettes and architectural styles and other things like that that will help preserve the characteristics of Rivertown, but also uh, for any new buildings in the future um, to make sure they're in line with, um, with what's already there. Thank you. I think it's very important, again, uh, the work that you're doing to preserve our historic center, this, this very part of our city where our city actually did begin. So I think it's absolutely imperative. It's the jewel of the city and should be, should be save, saved for the future. Thank you. Mr. Aber, do you have any other comments you'd like to make? Well, hopefully when they, uh, they do put together some design guidelines for us, uh, we would like to incorporate those uh, guidelines into our new unified development code which will ultimately take the place of our comprehensive zoning ordinance. And uh, we're hoping that uh, that will be adopted in the first quarter of next year. Thank you, Mr. Hebert. Councilman Impostato, you have the floor. Um, thank you guys for being willing to work with the city and help us in this. I want to make sure I understand this and everyone does. This would be similar to we hear historic development commissions and things like that where you know, potential developments and things have to go and be approved and that sort of thing uh, before they can can go forward, right? All with a line towards historic preservation. Is that essentially what's yep. what you're going to be developing? Yep. Okay. And and just to clarify, historic preservation certainly, but um, even new even new buildings, making sure that they don't have yeah. to mimic historic okay. styles exactly. It's not that strict, but within the style within the um, within the realm of, of what's there, so appropriate to its context, essentially. Right. Consistent with the, the mission of the exactly. district. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Councilman, we, we've Thank you. done these design guidelines for the city of Mandeville, which are in place. We review weekly, and we also did it for the city of Slidell, so, and other cities not in Louisiana. So we do have the experience. So what we're trying to do is give a base for the commission that exists to make evaluations to go forward on. Because right now it's a little bit tough. If you don't have any guidelines to, to base your decisions on, then you can't make a decision either to accept or to negate it. 
Thank you, Councilman Imposada. Councilman Carroll, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Mr. Mouton and Mr. Glenish, thanks again for coming today. Also, thanks for the last meeting that we had with you guys where you were able to introduce and you know, bring us up to speed on your vast experience that you've had over the many, many years. For us, the city of Kenner, this is like a blank canvas for us getting things started with the historical district. Even though we have started the process, there have been a number of, well, two or three projects that have already started that we have to make sure that from this point forward, there is some continuity. And even though some things have started, your ideas and suggestions have helped, we should be able to, in my opinion, rein things in to ensure that the businesses and the homeowners who are part of the Rivertown area are, are comfortable with what's gonna happen and feel part of it. And I think there were a number of things that we talked about that we look forward to bringing to the community, business, and the homeowners. So, Thanks again, and I am literally a couple of blocks, one block away from Rivertown, lived there my whole life. So uh, as a community, we look forward to you guys' experience and bringing into the city of Kenner. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Carroll. Councilman Conley, you have the floor. And just to build on this so, so I understand it, we're gonna make recommendations to the, um, to, to the council to approve, to incorporate into the competence of uh, zoning ordinances, and that would give the Historical District Commission some teeth? Yes, sir. Right now, um, the, uh, we've actually witnessed over the last 12 months uh, quite a number of applications, the most that I've been a part of over the last 12 years. And um, I think part of that has to do with us becoming a, a Main Street program. But um, one of the concerns with the Historic Commission is that when they do review an application and it involves exterior alterations to a building, they really have nothing to fall back on to determine if those architectural designs are consistent with the motif of the, of the district. So they, they brought it to, um, to my attention, and um, so that's, again, uh, we're, the goal is that they will uh, draft some design guidelines, perhaps some color schemes that we could adopt into our Rivertown uh, zoning regulations and hopefully uh, have them adopted soon. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Connolly. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate your being here and thank you for working with us in Kenner. We appreciate all that you do working together. We can make a really terrific difference in Rivertown. Thank you. Ready? Council Clerk? Yes, ma'am. Item 4B, at the request of the administration, an update from the planning department on the city of Kenner's pattern for progress comprehensive plan. Mr. Ajay, I'm assuming that's going to be you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted, to, again, to take this opportunity to inform the council that the final draft of the Pattern for Progress comprehensive plan has been completed. Um, as you may know, a couple of years ago, uh, the city was awarded a grant through the state's uh, $10 million comprehensive resiliency program. Mm -hmm. uh, that grant funded two things, uh, the establishment of a comprehensive plan and the, uh, the, the creation of a unified development code that will replace our comprehensive zoning ordinance. <coughs> I believe you guys have a copy, a draft copy of the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Following this meeting, we do plan to give uh, uh, copies to the Planning Commission, the Board of Zoning Adjustments, the Kenner Code Committee, and the Historic Commission. Also next week, we'll provide a link uh, to the document on the city's website for public viewing. And then I think that when everyone has had a sufficient amount of time to review the document, we will meet with, uh, reach with the council to discuss any concerns that they may have uh, with the ultimate goal of putting together legislation uh, and to have the plan ultimately adopted. So I want to thank you guys for your patience. Uh, it's been a long process, and uh, if you all have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Haber. I know how much work went into this. I know many of us have had numerous meetings with you, have attended other meetings, you know, with uh, not just with the council, but with the public as well. And I know it has taken a lot of time and a lot of effort, but I'm sure that the end product will be worth every minute of it. So thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Councilman Carroll. Thank you, Madam you President. Thank you. Mr. Haber, thanks again for all you and your department hard work. But I just want to make clear, um, get some good understanding is that after we get an opportunity and all the different boards get an opportunity to review this 
and it is, will be put on the website for the citizens to look at. Are there any plans to have any public meetings to be addressed from the public if there are some questions or concerns together, getting a couple of districts together? Are there any plans to be able to do that? Well, we've had, um, we've had two rounds of, of uh, council-assisted public meetings already. We've totaled, I think, 11. Uh, at this point in time, we feel you know, confident that we've addressed all of the, uh, the public's concerns and, and we've received their input and actually incorporated that into the plan. I, when, this, when the legislation uh, is put together, of course, this will go before the Planning Commission and, and at that time, the University of New Orleans will give a, um, you know, a public presentation. But um, if you feel that you want to have a, a neighborhood meeting, uh, I think that uh, That'd be fine. Yes, and I guess I should say, I'm not trying to you know, make, give you guys any more work, but after the questions, after input from the community, if we deem it necessary to have a meeting to be able to explain some things that maybe can't be explained or expressed through over the telephone or through questions, that we will be able to have your assistance in having at least one meeting for the community. Sure, that's fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Carroll. Madam Clerk, you may now proceed. Yes, ma'am. Item five is acceptance rejection of bids requiring an expenditure of less than $5,000. We have none. Item six is change orders requiring an expenditure of less, less than $5,000. We have none. Item seven is acceptance of committee findings for final passage. We have none. Item eight is resubdivision ordinances for final passage, and we have none. Motion by Council Member Connolly, seconded by Council Member DeFrancis on the consent agenda. Council Members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. We are now in our public appearance portion of the agenda. Yes, ma'am. Item 9 is the public appearance agenda. Item 9A is Public hearing, a public hearing regarding summary ordinance number 11,781, an ordinance to amend section 20.09, general sign regulations of the comprehensive zoning ordinance to provide electronic variable message sign regulations, case Z-2-14. Motion by Council Member DeFrancis, seconded by Council Member Conley to open the public hearing. Council members, please vote. We are now in a public hearing. Anyone in the audience wishing to address the council may speak after the presentation by Mr. J. A. Bear. Thank you, Madam President. The uh, proposed legislation is to amend the general sign regulations of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance by adding a new sub subsection that will regulate electronic signs. Um, currently, there are no existing provisions in our CZO to regulate the signs. This is relatively a new technology, and there are more businesses that are utilizing this technology for advertising purposes. Now, our goals in putting together these regulations uh, were to accommodate the use of electronic and digital technology and to improve the business visibility. It was to protect uh, residential neighborhoods from ambient light intrusion, to promote safety for motorists, to improve the visual appearance of the streetscape, and to put regulations in place that we felt were enforceable. The research involved a collective effort uh, that was performed by our staff along with the Department of Inspection and Code Enforcement and uh, University of New Orleans' Planning Division. The research included a national cross-section review of local e electronic sign regulations. We met with Jefferson Parish officials to discuss how they regulate and enforce their electronic sign ordinance. We looked at state and federal programs including the Louisiana Outdoor Advertising Program. We reviewed numerous publications from the sign organizations, such as Outdoor Advertising Association of America, the International Sign Association, and the Signage Foundation. We also researched scholarly reports from the American Planning Association and the Urban Land Institute, and we met with several local sign company representatives. Now, the proposed ordinance is rather broad, so what I'm going to provide you is with uh, a summarized presentation. With regards to the uh, regulations, um, number one, uh, concerning the face of the sign, we are recommending that either the entire sign face be electronic or if the sign consists of multiple panels, 
one panel per sign face may be electronic, provided that the electronic panel doesn't exceed 35% of the square footage of the sign. In addition to that, the display of the message or image is to be static, which means that there's little to no movement on the screen. Uh, there'll be no animation, no video, anything like that. Along with the static display, we're recommending a dwell time for each image displayed of uh, no less than eight seconds, and that the transition between one displayed image to another be instantaneous, meaning there's no dissolving, no fading or traveling transitions. And the reason uh, being is that the transition does not really communicate the message. It's just simply a visual tool. Now, these display standards are consistent with the regulations of the state's outdoor advertising program, as well as Jefferson Parish's electronic sign ordinance. In terms of the sign's brightness levels, we're recommending to adopt the same nighttime brightness levels that are adopted by Jefferson Parish, which is basically a maximum of 323 candelas per square meter. And uh, that's just basically a unit of brightness. The level of brightness is at the lowest end of the light spectrum. And like I said, it's recommended also by the Outdoor Advertising Association of America. For the daytime brightness levels, we're recommending a maximum of 500 candles per square meter. Now, this level was the most common standard of those communities that we had reviewed. Uh, we're recommending that the signs uh, are to come equipped with a photocell sensor, which, which measures the ambient uh, light conditions. The signs programming must come equipped with auto dimming capabilities and a malfunction display lock so that if the, uh, the sign malfunctions, it will freeze into one position. Uh, we're recommending, though, that if it does malfunction, that the owner or operator of the sign just simply shut it off until it's repaired. In addition, uh, the sign manuf manufacturer must provide written certification that the light sensors are installed, uh, that the light intensity of the signs have been preset not to exceed Kenner's maximum brightness levels, and that the preset intensity is protected from end user manipulation. With regards to some zoning regu uh, re regulations, we're recommending that no more than one detached electronic sign be permitted per development site, and that's basically what we have right now in our CZO. The sign must front along a roadway oriented away from the closest residential district and set back at least 150 feet from the nearest residential district or the nearest uh, electronic sign. We're also recommending that the owner operators of these of existing signs uh, be allowed to convert to electronic signs once it's determined that all um, applicable requirements have been met. Also, uh, any existing non-conforming signs that are wishing to convert may do so as well if the conversion actually brings them up to current standards. Now, signs containing an electronic panel are prohibited from being located in the city's residential zoning districts, with the exception of religious uses, public buildings, schools, and institutions, and that's provided that the signs meet specific criteria for each of those, including size, its orientation, its hours of operation, and its illumination. Now, not all signs that use EVM technology would be considered electronic signs. We do have three exceptions. Uh, the first exception are pedestrian-oriented directory and menu signs. Uh, these signs are most often used by restaurants or businesses that serve food as a secondary service. The second exception would be uh, menu boards for thri drive through restaurants. And the third exception are signs that advertise the price of motor fuels uh, by retail dealers. Each of those signs uh, would not be considered electronic, provided, again, that they meet certain criteria. We are recommending that the owners and operators of these signs be provided a three-month amortization period um, to come into compliance with the new operation <coughs> standards. Uh, that period would begin uh, at the date of the adoption of this ordinance. Uh, we believe <coughs> that three months is a sufficient amount of time for them to come into compliance. Now, when it comes to the measurement of the brightness of the sign, there's two ways to go about that. One is with a light meter. The second is with a knit meter. The preferred option is the knit meter, and that's the one that's used by Jefferson Parish. Um, there's a benefit to using a knit meter. Number one, you can take the measurement further back, which means you don't necessarily have to step onto private property.
With regards to the enforcement procedure, the way that uh, Jefferson Parish carries theirs and the way that we, uh, we would conduct ours is that if there is a complaint or a concern about the brightness of a sign, an inspector would go out to the site and take three measurements using the NIT meter. The average of those three would be the sign's brightness. If it's determined that the brightness level exceeds Kenner's brightness levels, a letter would be sent to the owner operator, letting them know when the inspection took place, giving them a copy of the regulations, and then setting a time for a reinspection. Between the uh, receiving the letter and the time that it's reinspected, um, we would hope that the uh, the owner operator would have sufficient time to actually reprogram it to come into compliance. At the reinspection, we would make that determination. It would be the brightness of the sign would be measured again. Violations would follow the same citation procedures as well. <coughs> the Planning Commission did review this. They recommended approval. Um, that uh, basically concludes the presentation. Um, I feel confident that uh, we did our due diligence. Um, but again, please keep in mind that these are new regulations. This is a new technology. And if it's adopted and the process is implemented, um, there's always a possibility that we may have to come back and make an adjustment or, re or revision, but uh, we're hoping that that's not the case. Thank you, Mr. Haber. I'd like to remind every council member that we will have a discussion. The council members will have a discussion after we close our, um, our um, public ag appearance agenda. I and I'd like to give the audience, anyone who would like to step up to the mic and make any comments at this time, you're welcome to do so. Seeing no one coming forward, um, I'd like to move to, that we close our public hearing. Um, moved by De Councilwoman DeFrancis, seconded by Councilman Conley. Council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0 to close your public hearing. Now we are, now Council members, um, anyone who would like to speak on the topic, please do so, at, please push your button at this time. I would just like to mention that uh, I believe Mr. Abair did a great presentation. He answered every question. We do have a mechanism in place, not only to determine if someone is in violation, I just wanted to point that out, as well as we have a procedure if someone continues to violate. So um, if anyone else would like to move forward and speak on this issue at this time, I will be happy to entertain. Councilman Klein, you are the first to speak. Can you tell me why the new proposal, uh, the signs are, are not animated, that they have to be static, as opposed to some of the signs we see around that are moving? Well, to give you an example of a, of a static image or a sign that's static, um, mostly all of your non-electronic signs are static. Uh, manual reader boards are considered to be static. They don't move. Um, if you, I mean, again, it, it, takes, it, it takes out the video, it takes out the animation, and from my department, we've received concerns about electronic signs where there's a video basically playing something out. Most of the, all, well, I'd say 90% of those uh, local government uh, electronic sign ordinances that we've researched, are, they're static messages. All right, yeah, would you explain to us the difference between the static non-animated and animated? Because a, a lot of folks don't know that. Static means that there's little to no movement at all. For instance, if you want to display the time of the day, it's going to stay stationary. There's absolutely no movement to that LED screen, as opposed to um, non-static, which would be just uh, almost like a TV, like, like you're watching a TV screen. Uh, uh, movement of tumbling dice, something like that. That would be considered non-static. Okay, and the second question is, I know you said there were three exceptions, uh, the service stations, the traffic signage, and there was one other exception. Men, uh, menu boards for drive-through services, um, pedestrian-oriented directory signs, and menu signs, which are normally attached to the facade adjacent to the main entrance into the building. And the third was, uh, yeah, Retail dealers that um, that sell fuel, such as your racetrack. All right, I'm a bit confused and bear with me, but those three exceptions are they accepted from the regulation, or are they accepted from 
static versus non-static? No, they are, they are, they're an exception to being considered an electronic sign, provided that they meet certain criteria. Right, so even those signs will be non, I mean, will be static, non-animated. That's correct, right. Right, okay, I just want to make that clear. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bear. Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Klein. Councilman Reno, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Ms. Vallow, I have a, just a couple of questions in regards to uh, um, compliance. Um, the NIT guns, yes, sir. have they been audited? <clears throat> yes, sir. And training for that? Um, we're, we, we're getting the guns ordered first, and I'm going to be relying heavily upon Jefferson Parish to give us some assistance with regard to that and contacting the company for ex additional training as well. Okay. We have two different... Um, the knit gun is a very specialized piece of equipment. I've only been able to find two companies that actually make that. That one company is called Gossen, and then Nikon Minolta makes a gun that is comparable to the Gossen gun. The Gossen gun is the one that JP has used, and they've had great success. So I'd prefer to go with that Gossen gun simply because it's been in use in Jefferson Parish. Good. And uh, as far as the... Uh the 84 calendar days for existing signs to be in compliance. Um, you know, I know some of this technology is new. As long as they're putting forth an effort to try to get it corrected, because I know the technicians and, you know, with, with digital signs, um, you know, you have people that have been in the sign business for a long time, but the technology has improved so much that they, they may not have the personnel, they may only have one guy that can work on those types of signs. And if you get a bunch of people calling all at one time, you know, there's gonna be some backlogs. So, you know, basically y'all gonna, as long as they're working to try to resolve it, y'all gonna work with the uh, Yes, sir, the we, we, we most certainly will be working with anybody that they need it. Oh, and you know, again, with the net gun, we'll be taking three readings. Mm -hmm. We'll take an average of those three readings and we'll give them time to come into compliance. And if they need be, if need be, we can be present with them so that they can actually tweak the machine. You know, typically it's a computer, uh, it's a computer program that they can do remotely, mm -hmm. and uh, so we'll be able to work with people. So if they need to, to bring it down a bit, we can sit there and shoot the gun at the same time and let them know, okay, you're right there. That's where you need to be. So certainly we'll work with everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Reno. Councilman Impostato, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Ms. Vallow, along with the, the, the knit gun, um, is there a plan to assign particular people to the enforcement of this, or will it be basically the same inspectors we currently have, and sort of at an ad hoc basis? Is there a plan for that? Well, what I, what initially we're going to start is with one person, one individual doing the inspections on that, and then I will be using that one individual to train each and every one of our inspectors, so that let's just say, okay, District One, you've got two days with the knit gun, District 2, you've got two days with the knit gun, so forth, so that we'll have everybody in a broad base. But I also need to come up with a system which to, you know, basically catalog each and every electronic sign that we have here in the city of Kenner so that we can keep a record of those to make sure that when we've taken our reading, that's the correct reading. If we get some complaint later down the road that maybe they, they turned it up, we can go back and say, well, on January 25th and, you know, 2015, your, your reading was at this number, you're elevated, so you need to bring it down some, give them a warning, or issue a citation. With the ordering of the guns and the training and whatnot, is there an estimated time when you would expect to be in a position to be enforcing the ordinance? Oh, absolutely, within the next 30 days. As soon, as we, days. As soon as we get the gun... Um, we'll, you know, we'll, we're going to start using it. And, and I'm, what I'm saying, you anticipate having the guns in enough time to be able to do that? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Abair, on the, the, the amortization, could you run through that again? Um, the, the lead time to come into compliance, basically, for non-conforming signs? Right, from the day of the adoption of the ordinance, um, three months or what, 84 days, I believe, um, which we think is more than sufficient. I know Jefferson Parish's amortization period was much less than that. 
Uh, so we think that three months should be more than sufficient. But like Councilman Reno was saying, if, if they need time and it, uh, they provide us with a, a show of good faith, I think we, you know, we would certainly be willing to work with them. And this does not change the size of signs from what our current ordinance are, correct? That's correct. The size, the height of signs, detached signs, attached signs are based on the zoning classification. That's not going to change. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Min. Thank you, Councilman Ampistata. Councilman Carroll, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Mr. Abair, first, and Ms. Vellard, I want to first thank you for, for meeting me in my office a month ago uh, to answer most of my questions. And I've had the opportunity to speak to some of the business owners uh, within District 1. Three of the main concerns that they had that I, I promised to ask, you covered very, very well during your presentation. One was, who was going to police it? The second was, how would it be measured? Because there are some concerns, you know, that we wouldn't show favoritism over one person who would just say it's bright, but the purchase of the guns eliminates that, so everybody will be on the same as everyone else. But And the third one you said that about each business will be fined according to, you know, they're found to be out of compliance. Have we gone so far to identify, will it be a warning? Will it be a fine? How much the fine will be first, second, or third time? Or are we still in the process of, of determining that? Um, probably Ms. Vella could better address that, but I would think just normal citation procedures. Uh, I, initially, I would like to, to give them a warning just mm -hmm. because it's it's new legislation and I want to work with them and see now if I come out a second time and I see that you, you know when we go and take the reading again we're gonna be taking three readings we'll take the average of that and that will be their reading um, whatever the our benchmark is which what's the benchmark 600 uh, 323 three, nighttime three 323 at nighttime so we're gonna have to take actually two different readings, one during the day and one in the evening to make sure that they're in compliance with it. Um, if I have to come back a second time, most likely they'll, they'll be issued a citation and be handled through code enforcement court. Right, and as far as the, the amount of the fines, are we gonna be pretty much in sync with Jefferson Parish or have you done a you know, review of other parishes and to see exactly, to make sure that we're, we're fair but also being Absolutely. within the uh, standard of the industry. Most likely would be more in line with Jefferson Parish in terms of the fines. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Carroll. Councilman Segor, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, it, just to kind of piggyback on your response to Councilman Impostata and Councilman Carroll, um, Ms. Uh, Ballot and uh, Ms. Abey, I know we spoke the other day about starting a log, so to speak, where you will see which businesses already have these signs, go out, take your measurements, record it on this log so we have a record that what they were uh, projecting at that time so that by the time this uh, trial period of warnings is finished, that if they did have any changes and, and complaints were filed and they, you went back out, you could testify that you had proof that on this date they were compliant, uh, and then after that, that would be a problem. Because a lot of these businesses, some of like what Councilman Carroll said I spoke to, they don't really know what their sign's doing. So right, exactly. they, they do need to have someone explain or tell them, no, wait a minute, my, your nit gun shows you're out of line, you need to go make these adjustments. Correct. So you will do that yes, and have I'm, that I'm gonna be cataloging basically every, illuminated sign in the city of Kenner. Right. So we'll have that as a reference mark as well. You know, on, on this date we took this measurement. This is this is their median and and go from there. And, and give them some pass fail notice that they can Correct. have for their We can record. give them a warning violation right. initially. Um, or you know in this first in this this trial period, this three month period, I'm not gonna even gonna give them a warning violation. I'm gonna say hey you know, this is what your reading is. You need to bring it down to this. We'll come back, or if you if you have the equipment available, we can do it right now and set the, the brightness at that point in time. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Segor. Council Clerk, I believe we have an amendment. Uh, yes, ma'am, I do. Um, at the request of the administration or the planning department, um, Section 3, number 9D should read as follows. 
daytime lighting EVM signs shall not exceed a maximum illumination of 500 candelas per square meter. Also, the sign shall not vary in luminescent intensity. Can I get a motion and a second for the amendment? Moved by Councilman Duke French, a second by Councilman Conley. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing no discussion on the amendment, we are voting simply on the amendment at this time. Yes, ma'am. Council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0 on the amendment. We're now back to the original piece of legislation. I, seeing everyone has had an opportunity to speak, I'm simply going to close very, very quickly. I believe we've had a very good presentation by uh, Mr. Abeer from our planning department. I want to thank him for working so expeditiously on this. Um, at a previous meeting, we had talked about uh, how quickly we could have him put this ordinance together. Uh, he thought he was going to need a lot more time, but he worked very hard to address the, the needs of this council by working quickly to put this ordinance before us. Uh, I thank him for his hard work and for doing it so expeditiously. Um, I've spoken to many people who had some concerns because we didn't have any regulations in place. And now those concerns should be put to rest with this piece of legislation. Uh, so if everyone is now ready to vote, I ask our council members to please vote on the original legislation. Madam Chairman, your motion passes 7-0. <laughs> Item 10 is opening of bids. We have none. Item 11 is reclassification of zoning for final passage. We have none. Item 12 is other ordinances for final passage. Item 12A is summary ordinance number 11,767, an ordinance designating and naming the Office of Inspection and Code Enforcement located at Building B, Suite 100, 1801 Williams Boulevard, Kenner, Louisiana, 70062, the Matthew Jr. Chiro Office of Inspections and Code Enforcement. Mo moved by Councilman Sig Oh, I'm sorry. We'd like to defer that for one more meeting. Oh, yes, sir. Move, I move by Council Member Segor to defer for one meeting, seconded by Council Member Connolly to defer, to defer for one meeting. Council Members, would you please vote? Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0 to defer it for one, uh, this item for one meeting, please. Item 13 is resolutions and motions by council members. Item 13A is a resolution appointing the members of the Alcoholic Beverage Permit Review Committee. Moved by council member Infestata, seconded by council member Klein. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Council clerk, do we have the names of our uh, appointees? Yes, we sure do. Would you mind reading them into the record, please? Um, Yes, ma'am. Um, Frank Compagno is the at-large Division A appointee. Scott Whitaker is the at-large B, Divi Division B appointee. Charles Tony Jr. is for District 1. Juan Suarez for District 2. Al Borg is District 3. Ashley B. Jacobson is District 4. And Ed Lancaster is District 5. Thank you. Councilman Rayner, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Christy McKinney, who served on, on this uh, board for uh, District 3. I want to thank her for her service. And I also want to recognize uh, Al Borg, who's here in the audience. Al, can you stand up? I want to thank you for committing to, to serve on this for us. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Reno. Councilman Pistato, you have the floor. As a former member of that committee, um, I'm, I've worked with a couple of the people who are on it, and I think we have a good group. Um, I definitely hope that they will take this issue seriously, and to be candid, I, I was part of a group that doubled the fines um, and increased the enhancement, mm -hmm. and honestly, I hope they'll follow that trend and, and I would ask the members of that committee 
to uh, take it more seriously. And to be honest, our fines have actually not been um, nearly what Jefferson Parish does. Um, having gone to some of the hearings for the Jefferson Parish Alcohol Permit Review Board, um, our enforcement has not been, uh, well, our police have done an excellent job rooting out and, and enforcing it, but I hope that, um, that the fines will be consistent with the offenses um, and in line with what we're seeing our neighbors do and the, with the seriousness that they've taken it. So that's my only comments, and I'm sure this, I have the utmost confidence that this group of seven will do that. So. Thank you, Councilmember Posada. And I just want to point out that our previous board did a phenomenal job in eliminating especially a business that was extremely shady and was absolutely an embarrassment to this city. And so I compliment them on their past hard work, and I'm sure you're right that this group will continue to work very hard to, uh, to do it, an excellent job. Councilman Carroll, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And I, too, would just like to thank the the group of gentlemen and, and females, if there are some, who will be serving on the board. It is a very important uh, committee, as Councilman Epstata stipulated, that some of these bars, some of these things that happen are close to neighborhoods, close to the businesses, the hotels. So it's important that we as the city of Kenner stand out to ensure that visitors coming in, that they can feel comfortable and safe uh, without having to endure any type of uh, safety issues or, or concerns that they or their family may have. Yeah. I would like to personally thank Mr. Charles Tony Jr., who will be the representative of District 1, a young man, attorney. Look forward for him working real hard on this and uh, doing a great job. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Carroll. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Seeing no one else wishing to speak, council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. Item 13B is a resolution authorizing the mayor to make an application to the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality Municipal Facilities Revolving Fund Loan Program for a loan to finance improvements to the wastewater collection, treatment, and disposal system of the city of Kenner, including the demolition of decommissioned plants, which loan will be represented by bonds to be issued by the city of Kenner and sold to the Department of Environmental Quality, appointing the Becknell Law Firm, APLC, as bond counsel and other matters in connection therewith. Moved by Council Member Klein, seconded by Council Member DeFranches. Council Member Klein, would you like to speak on this issue? Would you please push your button? <laughs> Thank you. Give me a second. Particular to District 4 is, is needed. The old sewage treatment facility near Chateau Estates Country Club has been vacant since the 1990s. And now we have the funds with this loan to demolish that entire plant and some other improvements, which I'll talk about in a minute. The old sewage treatment plant uh, near Chateau obviously is a hazard to kids, to other people. It's been vacant for a long time. It's blighted. Uh, we had some problems over there with the teenagers and stuff. So it, it's time for that to go. It'll be an improvement with the city of Kenner. Also, there's an old treatment, uh, sewage treatment facility near the brake tag station. That will be completely demolished as well. So both of those have been decommissioned for a long time. The new treatment facility is by the West Canal. Uh, also, new force mains will be placed in from the Chateau area along the Duncan Canal, I-10, to the new uh, West Return facility. Uh, all those improvements are necessary. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements to the sewage in the city of Canada over the years. This will be a huge improvement. Uh, also, one other thing is that uh, because we're very efficient, we have a number of gem generators to operate the lift stations. If you have a hurricane, electricity goes out, the lift stations don't work, therefore the sewage don't work. You can't flush your toilet, etc. So we need to build a new warehouse and these funds will be a part to, to build a new warehouse where we can house generators. We have at least 78 lift stations around the city. We have generators for all of those. Right now they're out in the weather. So if we can build a nice warehouse to, to house them, 
certainly they'll last a lot longer in a warehouse than they will out in the elements. So for all of those reasons, I support it, and I would ask my fellow, fellow councilmen to do the same. Thank you, Councilman Klein. Councilman Reno, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Mr. McConnell, uh, the, the um, repayment of, these, uh, of this loan, um, how would that be handled? Um, we currently have two DEQ loans that we did in the mid-90s, one in 1994 and one in 1995. Those two loans are going to be paying out in 2016. Um, they have two years' worth of payments left. The, the payments for the 14-15 fiscal year are already in the 14-15 budget, um, which we're in right now. And both of those loans have reserve funds, and the reserve funds will be available to make the final payment in 2016. So all of the money to, to finish debt servicing those two loans is already in place. So the money that's debt servicing those loans will, will just debt service the new loan. It would be about the same amount. The, the debt service on the new loan will be about the same amount as the combined debt service on the two loans that are maturing. So the same money will be used to pay the new loan. Won't, won't have to find any additional money. Uh, we have the money in place to do it. And how would that affect our overall debt ratio? Um, you know, as you know, Standard & Poor is one of the uh, criteria they use to measure the amount of debt you have is your debt per capita, which is your, you know, uh, outstanding debt divided by your population. Um, between 1,000 and 2,000 is a, in the low category. We are currently at about a little over 1,600. Even with the additional loan, we would be at about 1,800, so we're still in the low category. And keep in mind, we pay down about five to six million dollars of debt each year. So this is a, a, a two-year construction period, then it gets put on a permanent payout. By the time we finish drawing down the money, we'll be back down to about 1,600 just from the normal payments we make. So we'll, we'll stay in the low category, and you know, we'll continue to, uh, continue to be in the low category, in the mid-low category. And the interest rate on the loans that are getting ready to be um, you know, paid out? Those two are at 2.95. Those are low interest loans, but at the time, those were 2.95%, whereas the new ones, the one we did in 2009, 2012, and this one would be 0.95%, so it's actually two points lower. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Reno. Councilman Carroll, you have the floor. Thank you, Ma Thank you Madam President. And, you know, I, too, will be supporting this application. I think it is something for every citizen in the city of Kenner to have this part of quality of life to ensure that their drainage or sewage is something that they can be can have confidence in every day that they wake up in the morning and at night that it is not in question that they are concerned about sewage being a problem so everyone in the state of Kenan deserve this from the river to the lake um, as far as it relates to the overall application I had an opportunity to speak with uh, mr mcconley once the application is submitted, the numbers in the situation that we have to look at as part of our job, we'll be doing, but it's, it's safe to say that this is something that every citizen in the city of Kenner deserves, and we should do our best to try to ensure that they have this quality of life. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Carroll. Councilman Zimpistato. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, could you just, I know Councilman Klein gave a, a, a partial summation of the work to be done. Could you give an overview of what, what work this, uh, this bond issuance would, would cover? Okay, the uh, big component on this bond issue is an, the installation of a new sewer force main, which is probably gonna be roughly either 30 or 36 inches in diameter that is gonna connect the Chateau Transfer Station, which is behind the uh, Chateau Country Club. And it's going to go along the Duncan Canal, and then it's going to go west along I-10, and it's eventually it's going to end up at the wastewater treatment plant. The force main that is in place out there right now is roughly 25, 30 years old. It used to handle treated sewer from the Chateau Transfer Station to the wastewater treatment plant. That's not happening anymore. Right now it's handling untreated sewer. So the lifespan of, of that pipe that is in place right now is, is near the end of the lifespan and it has created some problems for us. So we feel like there is a need to lay the sewer force main uh, in, in the very near future. That's, that's the big component of, of this. This is an $11 million project that is gonna be split into three phases. The other one is the demolition of the plants. Uh, and that's the one at Chateau, and, and that's the one by our Public Works Department. That's roughly about a $1.7 million component. And, and the final one is the construction of a warehouse to house uh, 
the generators that are exposed to the weather right now and, and the ones that we intend to purchase through potential grants that you know, we, we feel like we can secure in the, in the near future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McConnell, my understanding is th these, are, these are major improvements. The, are these the result of that DEQ compliance order? Yeah, the whole program uh, started as a result of the compliance order. So w what this will do is give us the rest of the money we need to do the rest of the, the projects to, to, to finish the program and, and hopefully get out from under the order. DEQ will not tell you until after you do the improvements and they look at it, uh, what they'll do. But uh, what we've been told is, you know, they've approved the program and once these improvements are made, we should be able to get out from under the order. And am I correct when I say that the measures that were taken in pla taken place, put into place in 2010 by the council at that time and the administration with the surge charges will hopefully alleviate the need for this kind of major overhaul in the future, correct? Yeah, what we're hoping is that, um, you know, once, you know, we, we did the, the four-year increase, the last increase was last year, and now it has a CPI on it so that the revenue will keep pace with what we need. So, you know, once this program's done, we should have money on an annual basis to, to do ongoing improvements so that we don't get back into this situation. And that will prevent us from having to do th this. Is a, this is to finish that process so we hopefully won't have to do this, this again for the surge system, right? Yeah, we'll have the funding mechanism in place. Right. We're hoping that from that point on, the, the money we'll have available on a regular basis will keep up with the projects right. we need to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Impostas. Councilman Segor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, just to kind of piggyback on Councilman Impostas' uh, comments, uh, Mr. Connell, the, the monies that are being charged on people's uh, water bills now for sewer, capital, maintenance, and all that, that in itself will not increase because of this loan. No. It stays the same. Stays Those the increases same. will only be from the legislation in 2010, which you now said will be just from the CPI increase. Right. The only increases will be each January based on a change in the consumer price index. So this, this loan does not increase any new fees for sewage, just no, continues the work to make the system better. Correct. Uh, good. Uh, next is, uh, since one of these uh, facilities is in my district, uh, by Public Works, and once it's torn down, is any, do, I mean, uh, Quigley, any idea what y'all gonna do with that property? Well, it's part of, it's part of our overall Public Works yard. I know we have some plans to one day to have a, a, a drop off similar to Jefferson Parish has for um, construction debris so, and uh, household goods. So that would give us an area to build some type of area like that. That's one of our goals to do something like that and that would enable us to put some type of, uh, I don't want to call it garbage, but like a construction and sure. debris I mean, type. something that we, I know I get a lot of complaints, right. people yeah. can or can Yeah, there's something similar on David Drive, but that that's one of our goals and that would enable us to have an area to do that. Okay, and uh, Councilman Klein, maybe I did ask your question, but his property where this, the plant sat, when that gets torn down, uh, plans for it? Any idea? I mean, is it just gonna be vacant for a while? The, the Chateau plant. About the, where the decommissioned. Uh, oh, okay, after that, yeah, well, th yeah, we, then we'd, we'd have to try to come up with some way to put that back into commerce, but uh, there's no imminent plans on that, but you know, it certainly give us, back into yeah, commerce. it could certainly, our goal would try to put that back into commerce some kind of way. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Segor. And um, just a couple of quick points. First of all, um, again, when in 2010, we did something that I thought was very important, and that is to add an amendment that would ensure that every penny collected would go into the enterprise fund, which would mean that, as Mr. McConnell said, we had money for the future to do the repairs and the maintenance that needed to be done without continuously going back to the public and asking for, for money. And that was very important to me as one of the members of the council then, and that's exactly what we did with, with that amendment. So that's number point number one. Number two, um, there, Mr. Gonzalez, you and I have talked at length about this. We have looked, have we not, 
for any kind of federal grants and you know for hazard mitigation, et cetera, that would help to um, to help finance some of the cost of decommissioning uh, the plant in that area. And we weren't able to find any, were we? Not big ticket items. What we have managed to find through a brownfields uh, loan program, not not loan through a grandfield grant program, is funds to study the areas and also to do some testing, okay, which is probably looking at roughly fifty or sixty thousand dollars worth of work, okay. That w those funds we have found, okay. Now we will continue to to look for grants Absolutely. to demolish those plants. If we are not successful, then we're going to have to use these funds to do that. So we already have the potential for saving at least $60,000 by, again, having that money available to us for the kind of research we have to do on the area to make sure that we can move forward safely, correct? Absolutely, yes. And on top of that, we're still going to look as hard as we can to find additional federal funds to it. Absolutely. Because the more money we get from on those grants, the more money we have available to do the kind of work that we've been talking about, you know, to be in compliance with the with the DEQ and all the other problems that we have been addressing for the past few years. Absolutely. So um, I thank you and I thank the administration for working so hard on this. And let me just say one more point. For those people that don't realize how important this is, that we also um, demolished uh, the area that we are no longer using that, uh, that decommissioned plant, we've had so many problems over the year. Not only have children, no matter how many times we secure the fence, have broken into that area, um, Councilman Reno called me one day and he said, Maria, there's a geyser in the air. There's water spewing everywhere. I went out there myself. There were holes everywhere in the fence where, the st where you know, young children had broken through the fence and water was spewing everywhere. By the time I, got th I, I was able to get there, the water was turned off, but that was a continuous problem. Um, I can tell you that a child, who, a young girl who had been following her brothers, and his, her brother and her friend, his friends, her brother got tired of her following him. He locked her in one of the buildings. And a woman walking on the canal heard her cries. No matter, and had she not heard the cries, who knows how long that poor child would have been in the building. And we keep building up the fence. We put, uh, we put as much, you know, of a chain link fence as we can. We put a wooden fence. But kids keep going into areas that are, you know, really an attractive nuisance. And a decommissioned plant acts as, an, as a nuisance for them, an attractive nuisance. Am I not correct, Mr. Jose Gonzalez? Absolutely. We, we have fixed that fence numerous times, and we have taken care of graffiti also a number of times. The area as it exists is, is a liability for the city. And the graffiti is horrendous. And I can tell you that Councilman Connolly, too, when he was running for office, so many of the people with whom he had spoken had mentioned the problem at, in that area, as well as to Councilman Klein and myself. So, but it's not just that area. We're also talking about the force main. We're talking about the warehouse. So this is... Uh, this particular resolution that we're asking, um, uh, that we're giving authorization to the mayor on which to move forward will address all of those issues. So uh, again, thank you for all the hard work and thank you for this council for being so supportive. Council members, seeing no one else wishing to speak, please vote on this resolution. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. Item 13C is a public hearing regarding a resolution authorizing the City Council for the City of Kenner to hold a public hearing to determine whether or not the buildings located at 3708 Connecticut Avenue, Kenner, Louisiana, should not be repaired or demolished. Councilman Reno, moved by Councilman, motion by Councilman Reno, second by Councilman Segura. Councilman Reno, if you could push your... Mr. Aber, are you doing a presentation? No? No, not yet. This is to set it for a public hearing for the next time. And Councilman Reno, you have the floor. Um, I just I want to thank uh, our code director, uh, Amy Vallo, for uh, all our hard work, and in, in, we've been working on this for quite some time now, so thank you. Appreciate it. And I hope I can get the support of the rest of the council. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Reno. Council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 
Item 13D is a public hearing regarding a resolution authorizing the City Council for the City of Kenner to hold a public hearing to determine whether or not the buildings located at 1805 Lloyd Price Avenue, Kenner, Louisiana, should not be repaired or demolished. Uh, moved by Councilman Carroll, second by Councilman Amber Klein. Uh, Councilman Carroll, do you wish to say anything on the topic? Therefore, see no one wishing to speak. Council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. Item 14 is items removed from the consent agenda. We have none. <laughs> Item 15 is acceptance of contracts and similar matters approved by the mayor. Item 15A is a resolution accepting as complete the contract with Frisch Hertz Electric Company Incorporated dated September 19, 2013 regarding the replacement of playground lighting at Susan Park Playground for the Department of Parks and Recreation. Madam Chairman, I've re received a request from the Recreation Department to remove this item. Moved by Councilmember DeFranch, a second by Councilman Klein to remove this item from the agenda. Council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. Item 15B is summary ordinance number 11,785, an ordinance accepting the responsive bid received from Economical Janitorial and Paper Supplies, LLC, for a six-month contract to supply copy paper for various City of Kenner departments in accordance with telephone bid number T14-2225, and an amount not to exceed $10,000. Moved by Councilman Conley, seconded by Councilman Carroll. Council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. Item 15C is summary ordinance number 11,786, an ordinance accepting the responsive bid received from, from Professional Construction Services Incorporated in an amount of $43,149 for removal of the old Lake Town wooden pier in accordance with seal bid number 14-6242 for the Department of Parks and Recreation. Moved by Council Member Reno, seconded by Council Member Conley. Councilman Reno, do you wish to speak? Seeing no one wishing to speak, Council Members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. Item 15D is summary ordinance number 11,787, an ordinance accepting the responsive bid received from Rainey Electronics Incorporated in the amount of $8,667 to furnish and install one scoreboard at Galatis Playground in accordance with letter bid number 14-1521 and approving a contract with Rainey Electronics Incorporated in the amount of $17,334 to furnish and install one scoreboard at, at Galatis Playground and one additional scoreboard at, pl at a playground to be determined for the Department of Parks and Recreation. Moved by Council Member Reno, seconded by Council Member Carroll. Council Members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7 0. Item 15E is summary ordinance number 11,788. An ordinance accepting the responsive bid received from Rainey Electronics Incorporated in the amount of $8,667 to furnish and install one scoreboard at Woodlake Playground in accordance with letter bid number 14-1522 and approving a contract with Rainey Electronics Incorporated in the amount of $17,334 to furnish and install one scoreboard at Woodlake Play Playground and one additional scoreboard at the playground to be determined for, for the parks, Department of Parks and Recreation. Moved by Councilman Impostato, seconded by Council Member Klein. Council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7 0. Item 15F is summary ordinance number 11,789, an ordinance accepting the lowest responsive bid received from Rotolo Consultants Incorporated doing business as RCI for a two-year contract in the amount of $61,094 for the Lake Town Median Landscape Maintenance Program, Vintage Drive to Lake Punch Train Levy in accordance with seal bid number 14-6240 for the Department of 
Public Works. Moved by Councilman Reno, seconded by Councilman Segor. Councilman Reno, would you like to speak? You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Mr. McConnell, the, uh, the cost of this uh, contract is to be paid out of what account? Out of the uh, Hotel Motel tax for uh, Lake Town. The, the Lake Town account. Yes. And, and the total for the two years is 61000 So right. it's roughly $30,000 a year. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Reno. No, no, Council members, please vote. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. Item 15DG is a resolution of approving change order number one final to the contract with BLD Services LLD dated January 22nd, 2014 regarding the Yellowstone Street and Platt Street lift station and force main project, which reduces the contract amount by 9,373 and adds an additional 21 calendar days to the contract time and accepting the project as complete for the Department of Public Works. Moved by Councilman Impostato, seconded by Council Member Carroll. Seeing no one wishing to speak, Council Members, please vote. Yeah, I think that, I think, I think it's 61 times. Madam Chairman, motion passes 7-0. Item 16 is ordinances and resolutions in summary for first reading. Item 16A is an ordinance approving the Cooperative Endeavor Agreement with Jefferson Parish Economic Development Commission, JEDCO, for services related to increasing economic development in the City of Kenner and related matters. Item 16B is an ordinance authorizing a public hearing and a budget amendment to approve Amendment number one to the fiscal year 2008 Home Investment Partnership grant allocation from the Jefferson Parish Home Consortium to the City of Kenner for the Department of Community Development. Item 16C is an ordinance authorizing a public hearing and improving budget and approving budget amendment number one to fiscal year 2009 and 2010 Home Investment Partnership grant allocation from the Jefferson Parish Home Consortium to the City of Kenner for the Department of Community Development. Item 17 is reports from the council and or special committees. Thank you. Uh, I have a report. Actually, I wouldn't even call it a report. I have a few uh, words I'd like to share with the, uh, with the audience and with the people at home. All of our council members and our assistants work with the IT department. Obviously, it's very, very important the work we do together to keep our offices running. But there's one person with whom we, on a daily basis, almost come in contact. And that is Jamie Godet. Jamie Godet has been an absolute asset to all of our assistants and to everyone on the third floor. I can tell you my office would not be able to function as it does if it had not been for Jamie Godet. And one of the comments that we often hear up on the third floor is Jamie never makes you feel inadequate or says a question that one of our assistants or myself or anyone else on this council might ask, that's a silly question. He always makes you feel that he wants to work with you, he wants you to be able to learn what you need to learn in order to, uh, to do well and to function properly in your office and do the work you need to do for the people of this city. And Jamie makes everyone feel comfortable. And unfortunately for all of us, he's leaving. Today is his last day. And we didn't want to let him leave without saying thank you, Jamie, for all you have done for all of us, for helping us no matter how silly our question, for always making us feel comfortable and never making us feel silly or stupid or inadequate. And again, you will be missed. And so from, the, from this entire council and our assistants as well, we would like to present you with this certificate of recognition. This award is presented to Jamie Gobe. Believe me, Jamie is very humble. He didn't want us to do this. When I told, I, I didn't tell him that I would embarrass him this way by making him come out here to receive the award. But we wanted him to know that we truly do appreciate everything he's done for all of us and that he will be missed. Thank you, Jamie. Madam Clerk. 
Yes, ma'am. Item 18 is new business. We have none. I'm sorry, would you, I apologize. I believe some other people would like to say a few words as well. That's Thank you. Councilman Reno. Th Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody and, uh, that there's a, uh, a shrimp boil on the lake uh, tomorrow, um, sponsored by the uh, Treasure Chest Casino in, in the city of Kenner. Um, $10 for uh, a plate of uh, boiled shrimp with uh, all the fixings. And um, the other thing I just want to, I want to thank uh, Natalie Hall, our uh, council clerk. Um, for these great little tablets that uh, that we now have our agenda on. Uh, great job, uh, her and the IT department uh, putting this all together. So now we don't need these paper copies. Of course, I have a paper copy because this is the first one with this. So I said, give me both of them. But uh, we'll be able to do everything off of this. So thanks, Nat. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Reno. Councilman Pastado? Come on. There we go. Yes, uh, everyone may remember a couple of months ago, the mayor uh, got a nice chuckle uh, when he was challenging the council for his ice, ice water challenge, which six of the seven councilmen uh, bailed on. Um, but that's, that's, oh, five of the seven, excuse me, councilman. I did not, and the mayor got an absolute charge out of the one that I did, which was an absolute debacle. Um, as I was trying to raise money for an organization called Jay's Defensive Line uh, for my cousin, who actually is a Kenner resident in District 5, um, who is also fighting ALS. Well, I'm pleased to announce that this Sunday, it was apparently so enjoyed by the nation that this Sunday on America's Funniest Home Videos, uh, ABC Channel 11, at 6 o'clock, uh, you will get to review, <laughs> view again my ice bucket challenge so the nation can laugh at the councilman in District 5 as well. So, uh, <laughs> so enjoy. <laughs> what time is it? 6 o'clock Sunday on the ABC, uh, WGNO, the ABC affiliate. And so after you watch, you should feel guilty and go to Jay's defensive line and donate <laughs> to the organization. <laughs> Thank you. Councilman. Thank you, Councilman Impostato. Council Clerk, would you mind giving Councilman Segor the mic before? Absolutely. We move on. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, just to uh, respond a little bit, uh, I agree that uh, we accepted the challenge and we have been working to try to get all of us together at some point. Of course, you know how hard that can be with scheduling and all the activities we all participate in for us to get together. So we are still uh, working on that. But I, but I do have a, a, a particular date in mind. I've been told by the weather station that uh, I think it's January 4th. The temperature is projected to be around uh, uh, 32 degrees. So we're going to shoot for that day and uh, so we can one up the others. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> Councilman Conley, you have the mic. Yeah, I'd just like to bring up that, as we all know, back in May, we had the Vietnam uh, moving wall come through, and um, it was a very moving event. It's in tribute to the over 58,000 uh, veterans that died during the Vietnam War at, at the request of their country to go serve. Um, right now, there's a nonprofit group called the Vietnam Veterans Foundation of Kenner that wants to put a memorial in the park to remember the wall and the 58,000 plus soldiers that, that died during that, that um, conflict. And uh, I'm gonna give the phone number, um, it's, it's Art Tadella, who's a Purple Heart um, recipient himself, and Debbie Albert, um, who have put this group together. They're looking to seek donations to fund the project. Um, the phone number is 504-915-5950 or you can call here at City Hall and we'll give you the information. But it's a worthy cause. They're working hard at, at raising funds and anything you do to help would be appreciated. Thank you, Councilman Conley. Councilman Carroll, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And I would like to first thank Councilman Segura for straightening up Councilman Impostata <laughs> by implying that we bailed on it. And it's just a little <laughs> miscommunication but you know, we may not be able to get on television, but we are gonna go through with it. We'll look forward to that. But uh, I would also like to thank the city of Kenner, the
the recreation department and all the parents and children, young men and young ladies that participate in the recreation department. This past Saturday, again, we have what we call Super Saturday at the Must Bertolino Playground. It was a great event for all of the football part of the recreation department. And just to call out the different age groups for the champions for the seven and eight was from the Green Lawn Playground. The nine and 10 was from the Buddy Lawson Playground. And the 11 and 12 was from the Lincoln Manor Playground. All the teams, even the ones who came in second, played fantastic. It was a good day, beautiful weather. Look forward to next year, the next sport that's coming up. But I also would like to invite everyone to come out. I'm not sure of the date, maybe someone can help me for the young ladies that will be participating in the cheerleading competition. Does anyone have that date for the competition for the cheerleaders? Mr. Go, oh there you go, thank you there. of this month, and I'm sure everybody will get their invitation in the next few days. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, sometimes the, the young ladies get kind of pushed to the side sometimes, not because we want to, but because we get so involved in the, you know, three major sports. I think if you have the opportunity to come out to see how much practice and effort they put into it, you will enjoy it and want to come back. So November the 11th, Punch Train Center, cheerleaders competition for all of the young ladies and some young men for the city of Kenner. Look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilman Carroll. Councilman Klein. Celebrated Veterans Day. We had a ceremony behind the city hall and they had the uh, military band was there. Michael Yanni spoke, several other uh, people spoke. It was a nice celebration. So I just wanted to tell everyone, advise everyone, the city of Kenna supports all the veterans and we look forward to having this memorial uh, in place. Thank you, Council Member Klein. And I'd like to remind everyone that we have a farmer's market in South Kenner. Uh, we would be delighted to have you uh, go to South Kenner and see what we have to offer. Um, for our children at the Esplanade Mall on December the 6th, there's breakfast with Santa at 8.30. So any of you that are interested in and have young children that would like to have breakfast with Santa, uh, you can enjoy a complimentary breakfast with Santa himself. Beignets, beverages, and activities, and it's always good to offer something free to our, to parents. Well, you know, it costs so much nowadays to uh, to bring our children to many of the events that um, are available to them. But this is a free event, so I wanted to mention that. And on November 15th, Santa Claus will actually arrive at 10 a.m. Um, if you go near Cafe Du Monde at the Esplanade Mall, they're going to have uh, children decorating cookies and games and funs with Santa. And on top of that, I would also like to mention for all of our people who uh, have to use the Crescent City Connection that the eastbound Cre Crescent City Connection, the right lane will be closed on Friday, this Friday, November 7th, from 9 to 2. So if um, that is going to cause a problem for you, you might want to take an alternate route. And that concludes reports from the council. Yes, ma'am. Item 18 is new business. We have none. Item 19 is unfinished business and our motions to reconsider or remove from a tabled position. We have none. And now we have item 20 is persons wishing to address the council on special subject matters. We have Martin Short. Mr. Short, would you like to come to the mic? He's gone. Well, then I'm going to quickly mention him for him. The 2014 Kids Fair, um, they're asking everyone to come and visit. The Kenner Police will be speaking to parents on safety. The Kenner Fire Department will have their smokehouse. The Kenner American Legion Post 377 will be there. Hot dogs are being donated. Um, Kenner's on White Tiger, Mar Kenner's White Tiger Martial Arts team will be there. The World War II Museum A team will, will be there to give their stories. So uh, you are invited to bring the whole family. The date is Saturday, November 15th at Veterans Park next to City Hall from 11, new, from 11 to 3 p.m. Thank you. You have the flyers. Thank you. We're going to have flyers on the table as well for you, anyone who's interested. Um, Robin Conklin. I, 
Would you like to come and address the council? It's up to you. You don't have to if you don't want to. Please come to the mic and just give your name and address, please. My name is Robin Conklin. I'm a resident of Metairie, Louisiana, 4912 Argonne Street. And um, my son, Reagan Wallace, is um, working towards being an Eagle Scout, which he should um, be very close to accomplishing. And we're also uh, very proud of, of Councilman Mike Segure, who has worked over six years helping my son to be able to secure, you know, a continual advancement. And it has been our pleasure to be a part of this entire proceedings. I mean, we have laughed, almost cried with the, um, with the World War II veteran. And it's just been remarkable. And I'm going to tell you, I'm really in favor of that cheerleader conference at the Pontchartrain. <laughs> I'm glad you pushed that. But we appreciated everything and hearing from everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you for you both being here to participate this evening. Thank you. A.J. Giordano. Mr. Giordano, would you like to step to the mic and give your name and address, please? Yes, he's on. Is he on? Um. Into the police chief. Um, A.J. Giordano, 3518 California Avenue. Um, I'm here again to revisit a serious problem in my neighborhood, which is the illegal parking of vehicles over the sidewalks. Um, Halloween night brought it up, brought it up to my uh, put close again as seri how serious it is when I've seen Parents had to walk with the kids and strollers out in the street. There's no choice they had but to go out. If you see these pictures, you'll see there's no choice in it matter. And that's why I'm re revisiting this in this public forum again, asking for uh, some guidance and somebody. Uh, but I, I, to cut it short tonight, I would just ask that this council, this administration, the police chief, somebody find a way, because I've, I've suggested to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, putting out a pamphlet to um, educate people about these things. Um, code sweeps, I've suggested. I mean, there's, there's got to be an answer to this situation. This is, this is really blatant now. It's out of control, and it's dangerous. It brings down, you know, your, your uh, property values, along with the safety, every, you know. This is just uncalled for. It's a law. And I just want to know, somebody's got to have an answer for this and work together and somehow push this through and get these people educated. Because believe me, I've had people cited. And after they've been cited, mm -hmm. they don't park on the sidewalk anymore. Or else the police have gone there under, under my, you know, asking them to and, and told the people, they don't park there anymore. But they need to be educated and tell them there's going to be consequences if they don't do it. But we just, so far, you know, this has been over a year now. This has started in July 2013 when I first pushed this issue with the mayor, when I first met with him. Okay, so Mr. that's where Giordano, I'm at. Mr. Giordano, I just have one quick question. Were most of these um, photographs taken in your immediate neighborhood? I'm sorry, what? Were most of the photographs taken in your immediate <laughs> neighborhood? Yes. Yes, ma'am. I can give you hundreds more if you want. Thank you, Mr. Giordano. And, uh, we do have a code committee working on a lot of these issues, and uh, um, our police uh, chief has pictures as well, and I'm sure he'll look into well, it. Well, I've sent emails. I haven't had a response back yet. Uh, I would just appreciate that somehow we work towards this, and it's again. And you're right. It is a danger for our children if they have to walk into the street, and our children should always be a well, primary you see the concern. Pictures, there's no doubt there's no way to have to. Thank know. you so much, All sir, right. for coming to this council. Mr. Al Morello, would you please step to the mic and, and uh, give your name and address? Al Morello, 4260 East Loyola Drive, 5th District, 42 years. Um, I want to commend, I want to start off, I want to commend our Civil Service Board for the decision they rendered uh, to reinstate one of our employees who was wrongfully terminated. Uh, I attended every one of those hearings. And for the benefit of the people of Kenner, I would like to say what was on display during those hearings. The ruthlessness, the vindictiveness, and the incompetence of this administration. And as a result, once again, the citizens, the taxpayers of this city, 
on the hook for legal fees, which I understand could go as high as six figures. Okay, now I hope the message that was sent from this decision rendered by our Civil Service Board was that we expect our employees, our employees, to be treated with respect and dignity. Now, I want to, I got a comment for you, Councilman Impostato. At the last meeting, the topic of, my topic of discussion was that catastrophe waiting to happen on that bridge by my house with that natural gas line running alongside of it. Now, since that last meeting, nothing has been done physically anyway, unless you have something in the works that's, that's being discussed that I don't know about. And if so, I'd like you to bring me up to date on that. And, you know, maybe, pen, you know, uh, going by an article I read in the Times Picayune, maybe uh, the priorities in District 1 on issues in District 1 may be a bigger priority for you than the issues in your own district, which is District 5. So now, if there is anything in the works to, to, to take care of this catastrophe waiting to happen, I'd appreciate an update. Anybody got any comments, any questions for me? Councilwoman DeFrancis, he can respond. Uh, I got any time left or what? Uh, yes, sir, you have, a, you have about 10 seconds left. He can respond while I'm up here? I, I would like you to finish any other comments you have, sir. That's all I have. Okay, then, since you have completed your questions, I will allow Councilman Thank you. Impostato now to, to have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Morello. Mr. Councilman Impostato. In response to the issue of the, the natural gas pipeline, uh, remarkably, in the last two weeks, we've not been able to solve that problem. Um, anything you want to know about what's going on in District 5, my door is always open, Mr. Morella, just like it is to everyone. You have my cellular phone number, as do all 15,000 people in District 5, since I gave it out about 17 times during the campaign. It's on my business card at the city. Um, I check the the call log at my office here at the city for any calls, which you never call the office, I don't know why. We had a town hall meeting the other night where we discussed everything going on in District 5. I failed to see you there. I would have been happy, and I still remain happy, to advise you of everything that's going on in District 5 whenever you would like. Um, I understand that the media was not there to report on each of those instances, so maybe that's why you didn't attend, but to suggest that I, my priority is not to take care of our district is simply a misinformation and just a matter of not really understanding what's really going on. But I would absolutely welcome any opportunity that you want to talk about what's going in our, on in our district, including the $2.1 million of projects that I spent about 30 hours this week working on to improve our district. Again, all of that you would have known. I don't blame you. You would have known had you taken any of the opportunities to actually talk to me about what's going on in our district, rather than coming to a public meeting and trying to make a spectacle where your goal is really not to gain the information. But I'd rather you take those opportunities. I'll spend as much time as you want, Mr. Morella. Come to my house and have a cup of coffee, okay? We could fit 15,000 in my backyard, maybe, okay? We'll take everybody can come get a cup of coffee. Uh, ask Mr. Daigle. We got good coffee at my house, don't we? Big backyard. All right, good. <laughs> come on by, okay? I'd love to have you, all right? Thank you, Councilman Impostato. Mr. Quigley, did you want, wish to speak? Uh, just, to, just to follow up what the Councilman said in regard to the bridge, uh, last meeting, um, Mr. Morella greatly exaggerated what could happen with that, that, that bridge and with that, that pipeline. We, we, matter of fact, we, met, we had a meeting with um, the gas company, Louisiana Gas, Atmos, and it's literally impossible with he described various subdivisions blowing up and everything like that. In the history of gas in this country, nothing of such has ever happened, and they assured us that it's literally impossible 
for entire subdivisions to be blown up, as he described. He, he named about four or five different subdivisions within the city of Canada that could blow up, and that's literally impossible. So, you know, there's, they, they assured us that even if anything happened, that there would be not, no be, there not be an explosion and it can be readily, the gas can be shut off readily. So this, this greatly exaggerated um, explosions that Mr. Morella told to the council last week is literally impossible. So we, we do not have these concerns. Thank you, Mr. Quigley. Uh, there's a gentleman, I assume, who didn't have time to sign in because he came a little bit late. Sir, if you could give your name and address, I'll let you speak. Thomas Griffin. 3701 Martin Avenue. I'm sorry. Thomas Griffin, 3701 Martinique Avenue, apartment B, Kenner. Yes, sir. Uh, I live in a condo. It's on private property, but I'm having troubles with my uh, neighbor who happens to be the... Uh, uh, I'm disabled. Okay. Physically and neurologically. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, my my neighbor who's parking, who used to park uh, th three feet away from my front door, has uh, is having a meeting. Oh my! This is going to take some time. I wish I could have have it. Uh, she's the uh, president of the condo association. She parks in front of my door, three feet away from the door, because the fire chief said they're uh, allowed to do that. But then again, you know, he also said if there's an incident that's needed, for ambulance or police to get into the apartment, the condo, condo, uh, there there would be uh, consequences if they were blocking my door. Now, th lately they have been parking away 10, 15 feet away. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the condo association's president's husband is a kind of cop. I've called Kenner Police about the issue, which they can't do anything on private property. So that's why we got in touch with the fire chief to, uh, you know, see what could be done. Same old thing, you know, nobody's listening, whatever. And uh, we're having a meeting on Sunday. I don't know what time, I forgot. But, uh, you know, does, is there any uh, resources of the ADA that I could get in touch with to possibly uh, give me some more resources? Like, I have a wheelchair. Sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. You know, I, I can't get outside because I don't have a wheelchair ramp. And I would like the uh, task city. Financially, I'm broke. You know, I'm, I'm, my wife and I are both working. We're struggling. I hope I'm not rambling on in any way. No, you're fine. Let me just say this. Um, Miss, I saw Miss Vallow taking some notes. If you could make sure that we get your name and some additional information from you. We have worked with other people in this city. I can tell you very honestly that we have done that. I'm so proud of some of the work this city has done um, to try to help those that have some problems that need to be addressed, those who have, you know, neurological problems like yourself as well as our handicapped and perhaps just trying to, um, you know, mediate and see what we can do legally. So if you could pass that information on for just give a minute of your time at the end of the meeting with Ms. Vallow, I will check with her as well and get the information to the other council members and we'll see what we can do to try to help you, sir. Thank you. Uh, let me add that I was a guard at Lake Town uh, Park for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it is an eyesore, that pier that's out there. I still go there. I, I like it. 
but uh, I'm glad it's going to be removed. Thank you, sir. And we, like, as I said, if you'll just give a minute of your time before you leave to sit down with Ms. Fallon, we'll get some more information and see what we can do to try to help you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilman Carroll, you have the floor. Thank Madam President. <clears throat> I'm sure Ms. Vello will, once to get the, the gentleman's information, will also pass on some information from Ms. Alita Terrell from Community Development, who I'm sure have dealt with different situations like this before, also as it relates to a possibility of a ramp, some information. So Ms. Vallot, please uh, get the information. She's talking now. The past information on to Ms. Terrell. I will talk to her tomorrow and connect it to, to be able to assist. As I said, once we get the Thank information, you. we'll make sure it gets to the, prop, to the uh, proper person that can actually address the problem. Thank you, Councilman Carroll. Councilman Segor. of neighborhoods being blown up by a gas rupture. Uh, Councilman Infostad is I'm sure taking care of what he needs to take care of, but it is unfortunate when someone does take the few moments that they're allowed to speak before us and exaggerate issues that they probably don't have the true knowledge of. And as Mr. Quigley said, he has spoke with the gas company and, and they have uh, obviously given their assurance that that can't happen, but I, I'd like to just sort of portray a first-hand experience, and that is uh, as a Kenner policeman working for the city when the Pan Am plane crashed in the city, uh, loaded down with thousands of gallons of jet fuel. When it landed in the subdivision uh, behind us, it also ruptured gas meters, gas lines. There was no explosions that destroyed the neighborhood. There might have been some fires as the gas ignited and flames like a you see them from the chemical plants when they burn off gas. That is what occurs when a gas line is ruptured and is ignited. It does not explode. It has to be in a conf tightly confined means to cause an explosion. It, recently, the city of New Orleans experienced a tanker uh, transporting fuel on the interstate that uh, turned over and ruptured. No explosion destroyed neighborhoods. There was a huge fire that took a while to put out, but nothing disastrous happened as a result. I passed by that bridge that Mr. Morrell talked about to look at it myself and saw the gas line, which is lower than the actual bridge that you drive on. So any vehicle as we know was mentioned to be a car transport vehicle making such a turn um, would have to literally roll over and fall off the bridge before it would rest on the gas line and perhaps cause a rupture and then if ignited cause a fire which would be to a greater extent a cigarette lighter fire. It would burn at the exposed end of the gas, it would burn until it's turned off or the fire department you know, could render their aid. But again, it's just disheartening that the public can hear about explosions that might destroy a neighborhood and nothing being done about it. We just don't have those things in the city that, that are that detrimental. So I, I just want to pass that on to our public. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, um, this meeting is adjourned. Moved by Councilman Conley, seconded by DeFra Councilwoman DeFranches. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>